Hello, Dr. Bowers. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. You, you are the superintendent of the Livermore Valley Joint Unified School District. It's a K-12 district serving 13,500 students. And it's a post that you've held since 2010. And from what I understand, this makes you the longest continuously serving superintendent of a K-12 unified school district in both Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Wow, <laughs> that's so exciting. You know, I think it's important to also point out that your public education experience is quite extensive, right? With 13 plus years teaching at all levels in urban and suburban settings, and more than 21 years in site and district level administration. Yeah, that's very impressive. Your educational leadership has been honored by the Association of California School Administrators, American Association of University Women, Phi Delta Kappa, Phi Beta Kappa, CSU East Bay, the Alameda County Board of Supervisors, and the California State Assembly. And as an alumna of Berkeley, where you earned your BA in English and later your EDD, we are so pleased to have you back as a practitioner in residence at the Graduate School of Education. So I wanna say welcome and thank you for being back with us. Well, thank you for having me. And I'll add one other little award. Yeah. One of my favorite ones is some of the students at one of the elementary schools where I visited, they, they kind of named me the Super Nintendo. So I thought that was really <laughs> cute. So in addition to all those accolades, if the kids like what you're doing, it means a lot too. Can you talk a little bit about what it was or what it is about the Berkeley program that attracted you to it? Well, certainly because I always have an affinity to Berkeley and, um, <laughs> and I've, I'm, you know, I have, here's my little mug, my cow oh, my and, uh, and my little bear, my Oski bear watching me, watching what I do. So um, I always, you know, I love Berkeley and it, it really, I did, I did research different programs and I knew that it was, that it was for me when I read just the whole description of it, which was focused on equity. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely, and definitely always a passion of mine. Um, I also, I mean, it's interesting because there are people who have challenged me on that because I'm in a suburb and I live here and work here to say, well, what, what is, isn't, isn't the equity work in the more diverse areas, mm -hmm. but actually the equity work that needs to be done now has to be done in the suburbs as well. And it's because um, they have been more isolated. And first of all, if you are impoverished and we have in Livermore, we have migrant families that are working the fields. You know, people think about the vineyards, but they forget that that also brings in families who are um, usually immigrants, they're migrating, they might be really mobile and not as um, stable in their housing, as well as second language learners. So there's a lot of challenges that they're facing. And so people kind of forget that in the suburbs because it isn't as high profile. Yeah. And so I've done a lot of work with the Tri-Valley Anti-Poverty Coalition with equity to say that the poverty is here, it's just submerged. It's submerged in the suburbs. Nobody wants to talk about it. Everybody wants to show this affluent place and celebrate all that. And we certainly have that. But then there are people who suffer in silence. There are war veterans. There are people who've gone through divorces or medical issues. There's um, people who are struggling because it's a really high cost of living. And so they're here. And then the added trauma for them is that they don't have resources readily available. Mm -hmm. Everything is over the hill or in some other pocket and, it, and the federal government and the state government are not pouring in to give them things because there aren't as many and they're not as empowered and so, or organized. Mm -hmm. So we have to kind of be their voice. We have to stand up for the fact that yes, there are issues here. And I'll give an example of the coronavirus. Um, there were a lot of resources being poured into, and rightly so, into Oakland and um, Hayward and areas of high poverty. And yet we in Livermore, there were no resources being poured into here because we were considered too far away from the nexus, which was the Open Coliseum. Mm. Yet we had tremendous, we had, um, we had a lot of cases and we had very low vaccination rates. Mm. And so I actually had to write a letter. I didn't have to, I chose to, <laughs> nobody made me. But I, <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote a letter and I had all our data 
and I wrote it to all of our local politicians and our health departments and said, pay attention, Livermore needs, mm -hmm. we need access, we need the vaccinations. And um, we ended up hosting, co-hosting 21 days of vaccination clinics out here because everybody wasn't gonna go there. Mm -hmm. And um, that made, it made a difference. But again, we had to advocate for that. We had to push for it. It wasn't a given. And so equity is different here. Um, the equity work is um, challenging because the value systems are different and people were, were not all on the same page. Mm -hmm. So you definitely get the polarized perspectives in a community mm -hmm. like Liberal. Yet we still all want to live together and work together. So, so we do it and we work with each other in um, such a way that we're able to still peacefully coexist, mm -hmm. understand that there's differences, but still move forward. Yeah. And as you were saying before, understanding that everybody kind of wants the same thing, but just has different ideas about how to go about it. Right. right. What I always say, the one thing that brings everyone together are youth and education. Mm. I mean, if you, that's why if you stick to that pure thing, we're just, we're talking about young people and their futures. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe just on a um, very practical level, what are your, say, top three tips for someone who wants to pursue their EDD? Ooh. Let's see. Well, I know the advice that was given to me was get it done. <laughs> so, <laughs> so don't, because the first time I, I, I took a break, um, I guess the most important thing is to, to make sure that you have a support system in place and that they are aware that even though you're pursuing the degree, it will feel like they all are pursuing the degree <laughs> um, because it does, it's just a tremendous amount of time. It's well worth it. But um, even, you know, even if you're very organized as I am, and if you have, um, you know, everything planned out, it still is a chunk of time on top of already very busy life. So I think having, um, having a realistic conversation with all of your significant people in your life, mm -hmm. say, you know, we might be texting more, it might not be that I can spend all this quality time, but, but it will be over soon and then we can, or bringing them into it, that's one. And I think the other big piece, which I've shared before is, um, you know, your, for your dissertation and topic, choose something that you really do care about and are very interested in and make sure that it's somehow connected to either the work you do now in your profession mm -hmm. or the work you are going to do because that will keep you engaged and will also make it relevant. And it will also allow you to kind of justify it to your job or your family or whoever cares about you know, your career it, it, because it'll be tied in. Right. And I think that's, uh, that's really key. And then, and then the lastly, I would just say also in your program, advocate for yourself because you know, it surprises me when I see leaders who are, you know, full principals or their assistant soups and they run little mini cities and they do all these things in their job. And then as soon as they get to class, they just sit and wait for the professor to tell them, you know, and it's kind of like, you, don't, you didn't just lose all of that, you know? So <laughs> it's, it's a symbiotic relationship and the professors, if you develop that with them, they definitely know a great deal, but so, so do the practitioners. And so it's, I think it's just so much more fun when you engage in that together mm -hmm. it's a mutual and, and there's recipro reciprocity in the process so I think rather than just taking everything just the way it is so you can help shape the program you can particularly a, a newer program and you can give give as much as you get mm -hmm. and I think that is vibrant and I think that was three but the other one would be to really establish a strong network even within your co colleagues and your cohort mm -hmm. I I, because I took a little longer in my program, I got to know a couple of cohorts, <laughs> we were in school, but it was kind of fun. Um, and we are still solid lockstep friends Ooh. for life. We have been through, I'm closer with my cohort people. I still have you know a couple of friends I stayed in touch with all through high school, like really in touch with and others through Facebook. I have a few in college and then the, um, that you stay, you just never let go. Yeah. But I will say the cohort people, because we went through a lot together and learned together and it was a smaller group, we are connected forever. So on this a little bit, um, but I'm wondering if maybe you can talk about it a little bit more in terms of 
some of the things that you learned while at Berkeley uh, as a student um, in the Graduate School of Education that you still use today? So, well, certainly the work on equity. Um, there's some articles and book studies that we did where we, we actually studied and we examined kind of the accountability measures mm. and um, you know the pressure to conform and perform and what that does to a system and what that does to the people in the system and does it create the type of people. So it really, so the, so what in the, in the graduate program, it really helped me examine things that, that some of them that we thought were givens. We didn't even know we could question the accountability mm. system because we had to be responding to it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but when we studied some of the systems and the, the fact that it came from, you know, through legislation and through well-meaning politicians and and being informed, we believe, by other well-meaning people in, in practice, um, the, how how it sounds and then how it plays out can be different. Right. Mm -hmm. So so the concepts of things like, you know, no child left behind or um, how after we had the luxury or the ability, I guess, to look back and see, did, did that policy change, that huge shift really result in what it was supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Or did it, did it in some ways improve things, but then what unintended consequences also mm -hmm. came about it? Mm -hmm. So I think um, what I really loved about the program was we always went back. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't think that anything was sacrosanct, we just, just because it was, mm -hmm. right? We had this mm -hmm. ability. And then we were given the tools to how to examine things, like to go back to what the original uh, theory of action was mm. and then how it played out and then to see and examine, is that what happened? And how could it have been shaped differently? And or, you know, what would we have done or what could we do going forward? And then my professors, uh, Professor Lionel Chan, he, at the time, I didn't know the value of what he was teaching because I wasn't a superintendent yet. But mm -hmm. I mean, I still engaged in it, but we looked at budgets and he had basically said, superintendents don't lose jobs because of um, because of test scores usually. They, they lose jobs or student achievement because they lose jobs because of uh, budget fiasco. So mm -hmm. you cannot, I mean, he literally just started off said, don't be the superintendent that just says, oh, that's the CBO's job, right? That's not my thing. You need to not micromanage it, but you are integrally involved in the decision making and the processes of that, and and you have to track it. And and he 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 really demystified audit an audit from a school finance position, which is really I don't know if you know anything about school finance, but it's it's not it's a it's quite an animal. Yeah. So so those things that was like a practical course mm -hmm. that translated to my job, but the other things I think were the mindset, the mindset of. Mm reading and questioning. And so I often start my management work or my, uh, we are doing book studies right now. So some of those same things that we did to keep, cause not everyone in my organization is going to be in a doctoral program. And some of them had their masters years ago. Mm -hmm. And so how do we keep them fresh and alive with and current? Mm -hmm. And so we do that through our own book studies and through our um, PLCs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think all of those things I learned and then we practiced them. That's great. So what drew you back to the GSC now that you are a practitioner in residence? So I always have stayed, I don't feel like I ever left. So I mm. guess I always stay connected um, with, the, with our GSC because I, I still go annually to whatever the reunions we are. I don't know if they're called reunions or the get togethers, mm -hmm. but I've always done that. Um, I've been on some panels with recruitment I took a lot of pride and um, excitement in the program. And so, mm. and it was really something that was very positive for me. But so far, it appears that when anything I've been part of, I've received feedback that says it was value added. And that's my goal that, you know, to contribute, not to intrude or interfere, mm -hmm. um, but to add. And I, I feel like it's only going to grow more um, as the students are more comfortable and further along in their progress. Mm -hmm. I just want to be a resource for them um, and make their experience as, um, you know, as extraordinary as mine was. 
Well, thank you so much. It has been an incredible joy to talk with you today. Do you have any closing thoughts, um, either about education, Berkeley? You know, oh, yeah, I think, well, I do think that, I think the most important thing is we do need to cultivate the leaders of tomorrow. And so as you, I mean, we've talked for a while that I've been here a while, but, and it shouldn't be that unusual that someone mm. has been in a position. I mean, it's extremely unusual. The average rate for superintendents in the county has been something like 1.8 years. And so how do you get traction? How do you build momentum? How do you make systemic change if you're in a constant revolving door? So I do think that there's, you know, that we need to help cultivate and develop a more diverse and um, strong group of leaders who, you know, can continue to make education, particularly public education, viable and vital, um, because it really is. That's the big. That's the equity work right there. Education is all about equity. There's that is how you level the playing field, um, and it's the great if people, it's a great equalizer because when people have education, then all their opportunities um, open up. So when I talk about education, people talk about the achievement gap. I usually talk more about the opportunity and the exposure gap. Mm -hmm. And so that's what comes from education is those opportunities. And so I think our jobs are more challenging and demanding than, than they were for predecessors because of social media and because of um, a lot of the change that we're all trying to make. We're not just making change within our schools, we're making societal change. And there's a lot of leaders who are just leaving or retiring. Um, and yet we need the best and most prepared leaders. Mm -hmm. So there's no blueprint, you know, really for where we're going. Um, and I think school districts are just being asked to do more and more um, to support students and their families because there's so many gaps and we're working with mental health and social emotional learning and food and now health, all of those things. And so if we're being asked to do more, we need people who are prepared to do more, but also have the support politically and with funding to do more. Yeah. So, um, you know, we don't have all the answers, but we do know, like I, I have a lot of confidence in a program like Berkeley because you have such a think tank of knowledge, you have, people who are vetted and who have tools. So I believe that they will be able to navigate um, all these changing dynamics. But, you know, I think, I think you really have, we really have to have people, it's, it's like the um, Wizard of Oz, you have to have people have a brain, a heart and courage. And it takes all three. You can't just have a bunch of smart people because they have to be able to brave to make it be able to be brave and courageous to make things happen and to rock the boat and to shift the status quo. Mm -hmm. And you also have, have people who have really good hearts. So Berkeley's always been known for being all of those things, for being um, outspoken and not afraid to challenge, as well as attracting the most brilliant minds and then people with a good heart and empathy and compassion for others. So I think. If it's going to happen anywhere, it's going to happen through the Berkeley program. I have ultimate confidence. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Bowers. It's been wonderful talking with you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Oh, I did find one other thing. Let's see. Yes. This is my. Okay, this is from. I saved every single card of my old cards from when I was. Oh, wow. I went and found my old scrapbook. So yeah, this is the teacher of me. So yeah, I would do. So it was just my little cow. Scrapbook. Oh, that's so, great. And again, this shows my age, right? Because now <laughs> you have it all on, you know, technology, and you'd have. But this is old fashioned. My very my letter of acceptance. Aww. I I saved everything. The pictures. So. Oh, I love it. It's just like it's Birkenstocks. I don't know. It's, it's just, <laughs> we had our rallies. You know, so anyway, I just thought it was fun to pull up. It, it brought back some, my first round at Berkeley just brought back a lot of memories. <laughs> That's great. And then to show, and this is, and this is my graduation from my doctoral program with oh. my, our two sons. And so 
that was just that was a proud moment. So kind of just come in full circle. That's so awesome. And even this is really cute. My cow <laughs> mask. <laughs> go bears. Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay, I as I digress. Anyway, I just wanted to share. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.